Nakai the Wanderer is the new Lizardman Legendary Lord for the Hunter and the Beast DLC. And as you guys have probably seen through a lot of the early access, he is a veritable beast in combat. So today we're going to do the same thing we did for Marcus Wolfhart. We're going to go through those first 20 turns of what it would be like for Nakai. Now this guide is not going to literally go through each and every one of those turns. It's going to give you direction for how to approach those first 20 turns with your Nakai campaign. As I've said before, uh, those first 20 turns tend to typically be the same for almost everyone that plays um, any campaign. Uh, and after that 20, you tend to really kind of go, quote unquote, off the rails. So in this cam or in this video, how we're going to break it up is we're going to talk about um, the technology tree. We're going to talk about Nakai's buildings and how they work. We're going to talk about Nakai's individual skill chain, how to kind of progress around the campaign map, and then how to deal with the individual targets of hunters um, as you go through Nakai's campaign itself. So let's take a look at where Nakai starts, and he starts right here near the, the monument of Izadl. So we're going to embed this little bad boy in here. Give him a little skink. We're going to go over here, and this is going to spur a conversation on how's Nakai, how Nakai's um, new mechanic works. Because as you know, he is a horde faction, which is unique for the Lizardmen, and it is uh, the first induction of hordes into Total War Warhammer 2 in the Vortex map. So, let's see how this works. So now you get to dedicate the Monument of Izadl to one of the three gods, Itzel, uh, Zlan Hauka, or uh, Quetzal. Not to be confused with queso, which means cheese in Spanish. So what you really want to do here is take a look at what you get um, as far as bonuses go with each one of these trees. Um, for instance, Quetzal is mainly going to be focused on Skinks, Saurus, and Temple Guard units. Um, Ho uh, Zolanka is going to be focused mainly on casting, and Itzel is going to be focused mainly on Croxagors. Um, I personally am going to go for Itzel because that's the way I want to play this campaign. Um, what is going to be a little frustrating with this guide, and I do apologize ahead of time, is that a lot of your decisions with Nakai are really dealer's choice. Uh, there's no real superior way to go about this um, that's better than any one way. So as far as the direction of the campaign map goes and the individual temples of the old ones and investing in these, it's really up to you. So let's talk about the temples of the old ones real quick. Um, because we just kind of got into that conversation, and then we'll go into the, how the vassals work and everything. So the Temple of the Old Ones here, like we said, Quetzal, Zonka, and Itzel. We talked about how their benefits work. Well, as you progress through these little notches, every five points you get, of course, a little boon here. Well, every 15th point for every single one of these guys, you get a specific ability. So for Itzel, you get the ability to summon very strong Razor Dawns. Not just normal Razorons. These guys are souped up on some serious old ones steroids. Um, Zlan Haka, you get uh, the ability to summon these uh, like the electrical storms, more or less. There's six of them. And they kind of spring all over the place and do a lot of damage. It is a, a pretty like, wide-spanning vortex spell. Um, then lastly here, for Quetzal, you get a protection spell that for 12 seconds, um, the unit is invulnerable and unbreakable. So it's quite nice. So kind of take a look at that. So every five points, you're getting an ability that is going to affect all of your armies. Um, one thing uh, to note here is, and again, a huge shout out to Loremaster of Sotek here. Uh, him and I were just kind of shooting ideas back and forth and talking about these campaigns. So if you haven't, go and check out his channel. He does a lot of really amazing playthroughs of campaigns, and he does a lot of in-depth lore stuff. But um, if you noticed, this says Skinks, Saurus, and Temple Guard units. Well, if you remember the 10 in 1 campaign, it, it, it says 100% um, upkeep increase for Saurus units. And in the 10 in 1 campaign, that includes heroes, lords, uh, all Saurus units that have <clears throat> Saurus in their name, Cold One Riders, and Temple Guard. In this campaign, it specifically says Skinks, Saurus, and Temple Guard units. So. I think that they're trying to draw a distinction here for whatever reason, but when I hear Saurus, I think of both the cavalry and the, the infantry unit, as well as the heroes and the lords. So if you're confused about that, that's something to note. Um, now, every five points in, again, you get these little abilities here, <clears throat> which are at these major uh, diamonds. But you also get these abilities. So Scar Veterans of Distinction here gives you hero capacity and recruitment rank and unlocks Scar... Um, Saurus Scar Veterans, so you can get them in your armies. Uh, this one allows for Skink Priests. This one allows for Skink Chiefs. So 
depending on how you want to progress, either through these specific boons, as far as blessed spawnings, so you get Saurus Warriors with shields, um, Horned Ones, Croxagores, Carnosaurs, um, so on and so forth. I don't want to go through every single one of them. Um, so these boons or these individual army benefits. So again, I personally went with Itzel because I want, at the end of the day here, recruitment cost reduction on Croxagores and Sacred Croxagores, recruitment rank increase and weapon strength increase for Croxagores and Sacred Croxagores, since he already gives a substantial bonus towards these big bad boys anyway with their sock and bopper arms. Um, but it is worth taking a look at some of these blessed spawnings and decide if you want specific ones. Um, it can be very hard to see what each one of these does. So I will point out a few of them. Um, the Blessed Saurus Warriors here, they get perfect vigor. Um, these Blessed Horned Ones, I can't remember 100%. I think it was speed on these guys. Hide and Force, Cause Fear, Resilience. Um, or I believe it's actually armor. It's armor or speed on them. Uh, the Blessed Croxagores here, um, some of them are not very apparent, and I'll, and I'll show you exactly what I mean by that. Um, 46 speed, leadership, 100. Um, oh, it Missile Resistance 15, Siege Attacker. I think it might actually be the Missile Resistance. I don't remember if the normal ones have Missile Resistance on them, um, but some of these are very subtle and not huge. Um, the Blessed Carnosaur here, he gets 50% magic resistance. That's his really big claim to fame on that. Um, if we take a look to at... Um, Here's one that's a real good one. So these Blessed Sara Spears, they don't look like anything substantial. But then when you take a look at their Forest Strider ability, that's the kind of hidden thing that you get for these guys. So you kind of have to really go through these guys with a fine tooth comb to see what you get in specific. Um, the Blessed King Skirmishers here, they have a 70% magic resistance, which is quite nice. Um, these Blessed Coldwind Spear Riders have a huge increase in their speed up to 80 uh, the Blessed Stegadon has perfect vigor, and these Blessed Temple Guard, ooh, I can't remember, guys, I think they have a higher leadership, and what was it? It's a higher leadership, I know that, but I can't remember what the other, uh, the other uh, benefit to them was. Um, and then the Blessed Bestilodon here gets perfect vigor, um, already has blinded shots, of course, but... You just kind of have to pick and choose which one of these guys you really want in your army. Um, some of them, again, hard to determine what their actual benefit is. You have to really, again, look through it with a fine tooth comb. I had to cross compare their stats like 15 different times to actually see what it was. And it can it can really kind of sneak out of nowhere. So um, some of these are really great. Like, I honestly think that these guys are amazing. Blessed Saurus Warriors with perfect vigor. Very, very strong. Um, this Carnosaur with magic resistance is cool. Um, these Blessed Skinks with magic resistance are quite good as well. And these Cold One Spear Riders with 80 speed is pretty damn fast. To put that into frame of reference, Illyrian Reavers have a speed of 90. So they're going to be quite quick on the on the charge here. So that kind of sums up the Temple of the Old Ones. Just go with whatever you want. The big consensus here is that get one of them to 15. Um, but I think first getting each one of them to 5 is the, is the right move. Because if you get each one to five, you can get Sar Scar Veterans, you can get Skink Priests, and then you can get Skink Chiefs of Distinction. So I think getting each one to five, or at least the specific um, hero choice you want to five first is the right move before for investing the other one to 15. But again, go with whatever you want for your playstyle. Do you want heavy Croxagores? Do you want a really good Sar Skink army? Or do you want a lot of really good casting abilities? This is how you're going to have to de decide which of these temples you build out. And when you go with, you do that, you're going to build, aha, there we go, <clears throat> your, for your new vassal faction, the Defenders of the Great Plan. Now, this is the unique characteristic that Nakai has. Rather than Nakai himself controlling all these uh, little cities that he takes, uh, the vassal will control them for him. And at the same time, you have to defend the vassal. The vassal will summon up armies with using certain rights, and we'll go into those in a second. Um, but you have to really be on the lookout because you have to be able to roll back and defend any portion of the defenders of the Great Plan that is in trouble if you don't have the ability to use rights to help um, subvert any big armies or threats. Um, one user on Reddit here, uh, his name was Kratos Irving. He started a subreddit post, or um, a Reddit post on the subreddit uh, that says, Nakai the Wanderer's campaign tips, come learn 
and uh, gather goodies and such. But he had a really, really good point here. And it's his very first point, and he was saying that, and this is something I just never think to do. But you can go in diplomacy for the defenders of the Great Plan, and you can actually request payments from them. I, I don't think it'll work right now. Let me just try it. Yeah, they rejected it. Um, since they are such huge friends of yours, and as you expand, you can really just have them give you money every couple of turns. So don't don't be afraid to request payments for them. To have them basically bankroll the armies you're going to use to defend them. So really take advantage of the fact that these are your vassals. They are going to be controlled by the AI, and they're going to be a little dumb. But you can still get a lot of money from them as you kind of move your way through um, all of Lustria. And on that note, as far as like how the buildings work and your armies go. So what is new with Nakai is the way that his horde faction works. So no longer will you have to build up all these buildings for every single army you produce. Instead, Nakai will produce all of the buildings that allow him to produce units for the faction and then all of your individual lords let's take a look here i think we can we can do I, I don't know if we can do this right now no we have to have more horde growth unfortunately i, I didn't think we'd be able to on turn one um but as you uh basically you bring your other lords into it they will use everything he's created from a global recruitment pool and the abilities or i'm sorry the buildings that they make help to reduce the cost of certain things from that global recruitment so really, how do you approach Nakai the Wanderer's grand building scheme here? Well, I'm going to lay it out here for you in a very easy way to approach this. Your first order of business should be blitzing to the ascendant ziggurat of Sashwatan. Sa -sa -sa that, that, that word there. Um, and the reason for this is it's going to give you a lot of recruitment capacity, a huge reduction in your upkeep for all your units, campaign movement, but the biggest boon is your horde growth. Namely, of course, as soon as you get to the third tier of this building, you get access to Croxagors. So that should be your primary objective, is just maxing out that initial building line, getting all that growth, getting all those goods. After you do that, you want to move over here to the monu the old one monument, the monument of the old ones, and get this maxed out as well. This is going to further reduce the upkeep for all of your units. It's going to work very nicely for you, so that way you just maximize the amount of money you can get. From there, move over here to the Skink Spawning Chambers because you want to get access to the Sacred Croxagors as fast as you can as well. And then after that, move over to the Hunting Pack Pen. Just the level one. You can maximize this as much as you want, but you just want that army ability, the Feral Cold Ones, as fast as you can. And then lastly, go for the Sacred Contemplation Chamber to get um, further access to more Skink Priests. Um, from there, really, you can choose to maximize this quickly if you'd like. Um, it does really help out with your Winds of Magic, so you're casting a lot of really great spells all the time. Um, also helps out with uh, capacity and recruitment rank for your Skink Priests. But really, I mean, after that, sky's the limit. Do whatever you want. I just think that those are, that's a really good initial outline here. So just to recap, do this primary building line, then do the Old One Monuments, then do the Skinks, Hunting Pack Level 1, and finally Sacred Contemplation Chamber Number 1. That's really the best approach in my mind. Just gets you a lot of really good access to things, a lot of really good horde growth, and you get a lot of good upkeep reduction. That's really how you optimize um, Nakai's building. Now, how do you really progress on the map, though, knowing that Nakai can really just go wherever he wants? And this is going to be the frustrating thing I was saying. Go wherever you want. Um, Loremaster of Sotek had a really good way of saying this. Um, he was saying, draw a circle. Oh, oopsies. Draw a circle and conquer that circle. And then draw a bigger circle and conquer that circle. So basically, you're just kind of choosing every single location. Conquer it. Conquer it. Conquer it. So this one, do this one. Jesus. Thing keeps going away. Do this one. Do this one. Do this one. Do this one. Like, just go in a circle. And do the same thing over here, over here, over here. Um, and you can you can ally with Lizardmen quite easily. You can get a lot of great diplomatic relations with them. So take advantage of that. You can do very well with them. Um, you do have to be mindful, though, of your primary targets. So if you take a look at your objectives, you have to defeat four hunters, destroy the following factions, the Huntsman Marshal, and win the following battle, the Battle for Itza. Now, the way that this really works is you have these four targets here, very similar to the Illithanar campaign. We can see that Jorik is right here, or Yorick, I'm sorry, 
We can see that Hertvig is over here. Roderick is up here. And then Kalara is over here. Now, the, the, not, the thing to note about these two is that they're very close to the Hunts Marshal. You have to kill each one of them. And then once you kill them, Hunts Marshal will spawn and you can kill him. The Hunts Marshal will, Hunt Marshal will spawn in his capital right here. Now, one thing to note with each one of these, these uh, generals, or I'm sorry, these heroes, they will be embedded in an army in the location that it says that they are. Right here, here, and here, and also here. But my big word of warning is, do what you want, take every single location you can, and then really fortify and build your armies up before you even touch one of these. If you touch one of them, the entire Hunts Martial Expedition declares war on you and they will start attacking you from all angles. So if you are down here dealing with Jorik, Yorick, sorry, and you beat and defeat him, well, you're going to have aggression from here and from here. And if you're not ready with armies to defeat them, you're going to be really up a creek fast. So the way you can really help that out is using the rights. The right of allegiance allows all regions belonging to the defenders of the great plan to cause attrition to enemies, which is quite nice. If you know you're going to be on the aggressive and you know you're going to start an attack on one of these heroes, get ready to use this ability because it does cost um, old one's favor as well as the right of rebirth. And this one's a pretty good one as well because a non-replenishing army of blessed units will spawn for the defenders of the great plan at their capital. So... Just be mindful of this, that whenever you're going to get an army coming from a certain direction, um, see where it is in relation to the capital before you use the, uh, the right of rebirth. And then if you know you're going to have a large army and you can't get to it right away, use the right of allegiance. The, the AI is pretty good about making walls uh, to at least defend the cities. So they will at least keep an attacking enemy at bay until you can get there to relieve them, hopefully. Um, but at the same time, having that attrition all the way to the point of getting to the siege will at least help the AI deal with them if they have to fight them. So that should give you a really good idea of how to really kind of um, conquer the map and deal with the aggression you're going to deal with from the Hunts Marshall's expedition as well as how to use those rights. Now, <clears throat> another big portion of Nakai's campaign is his technology tree. It is different than the standard Lizardman tree, and that is for a reason. It has a lot of things that help you out with growth. It has a lot of stuff that helps you out with, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, diplomatic relations. There is a lot of stuff that you can do in this technology tree. So, honestly, it, this technology tree is, this is going to be kind of frustrating. Because you can do whatever you want here, but just go down this line first. Start the game and do this. Just do that. Let it run for 45 turns. And the big thing here is, again, let's take a look at each one. Horde growth, plus two. Casualty replenishment rate, plus two. Horde growth, an additional plus two. That's that's four now in total. Or building construction cost, minus 5%. That's, fifth, that's turn 15 we're getting all this. Sequence of restoration wins a magic and casualty replenishment rate. So that's now 4% casualty replenishment. And then immune to snow attrition, which you won't really be dealing with. But wound recovery time, minus one, which is nice, but really it's going to... We just want this one. An additional horde building construction cost reduction by 10%. That's 15 in total. That's 15 in total. And then a further uh, decrease to casualty, oh, I'm sorry, decrease to upkeep and an increase to casualty replenishment. So with all this, you get 6% casualty replenishment, another 5% reduction to upkeep, 15% reduction to the horde building construction costs, and you get some horde growth. So this is a very strong line. I can't recommend it enough. You can go down this line. If you want to worry about your armies right off the bat, you will find that you will have to go down this line eventually because this is how you increase your army capacity. Each one of these will give you another army that you can access. So my suggestion would be click this, of course, but when you get to a point of income where you know you can really sustain another army, pop this. And when you get into another point, segue off of this and pop this. Just pretty much be focusing on this line and use this one when you're ready for an army. Um, you can then go through these if you want, but you're going to get so many benefits from the temples of the old ones that these will become a little redundant, and you can really soup up your Saurus, or you can really soup up your um, your monsters through these trees. Um, but at the same time, like I said, the temple of the old ones is going to help you out so much, and when we take a look at uh, Nakai's skills in just a second, that's also going to help you out a ton with keeping your units pretty beefy. So, 
now that we've established pretty much how to deal with the campaign, again, just draw a circle and conquer it. Um, let's take a look at the diplomatic relations for the uh, the Lizardmen. Now, obviously, these guys are all going to be firm friends with you. They, they all love you. They want to be, they want to confederate with you. All sorts of cool stuff. So, Lizardmen, don't even bother. They'll, they'll just kind of join you in due time. Um, but my suggestion is conquer Lustria as fast as you can. Namely, of course, you want to get rid of Teclis, Kalita. I mean, you can you can conf or, uh, do trade with Teclis, but he will stab you in the back. I absolutely promise you that. So sweep through all the Skaven here. Uh, get rid of Teclis, Kalita, the, the Citadel of Dawn and Dusk. Well, just Dusk. I think this one's Dusk, right? This is Dusk? Yeah, this is Dusk. And just just solidify this this peninsula or, uh, this uh, island peninsula uh, whatever the hell as fast as you can. Um, my suggestion would be, in my campaign, um, I want the jungle of mists first and foremost, then the northern spine of Sotek. The dwarfs, if you actually ally with them in time, they shouldn't really bother you. Um, but I still think at the same time, it, it's just take over everything is my is my honest opinion. Um, it's not really going to uh, bother you. But just remember. As you expand, you have to still maintain these cities. The AI will build them up, and you have the option to pretty much extort them for, extort them for money, as uh, Kratos Irving was, was saying, use the vassal system. <laughs> but if there's any attacks, you have to be the one that goes and rallies to their aid. So don't expand too far south or too far inland without a secondary army to come and help out when you decide to attack any one of these heroes. So one of the last things I want to go through are the skills. Let's go through those skills for Nakai. He's got quite a few. Of course, he has his first spawn here. Um, this is quite nice. Get some nice bonuses for Croxagores for the recruitment cost and melee defense. Um, but let's take a look at how to approach this. Now, what's the most typical route, right? People just say, oh, choose Route Marcher as your first skill, then bump into red or yellow, depending on your, uh, your competency of the game. Not the way I would approach Nakai. For Nakai, Max this out as fast as you can. Board growth plus five is going to be sweet. Get that spawn to Vitzel maxed out quickly. Then move on to Draft Master. Get Lightning Strike because it's only going to make him more disgustingly strong. Then get Geomantic Sustenance to reduce your upkeep minus 15% again. So if you've been keeping track with our upkeep reduction abilities here, uh, 15 from the top of your base building, 15% from the monuments of the old one, then 5% from um, the, the research. So you're looking at, what, 50% uh, upkeep reduction between all those things. Then additional Renowned and Feared, which is also going to give you a further 8% upkeep reduction for uh, Big Bad Nakai himself, some campaign movement increase, enemy hero and hero self-defense, uh, as well as recruitment rank for all units, which is going to be quite nice. Now, when it comes to his personal line, which will unlock at level 10, you do want to jump into that real quick and kind of segue away from the blue line real fast just so you can do some big things here. Obviously, you want Legendary Warrior, so, but at rank 11, go with Cold-Blooded reflex, Reflexes. This can allow for Nakai to solo an army on his own. He will cause terror, and his attacks will cause Discourage. I mean, like, Skaven just can't deal with that. They're not equipped for such things. So I recommend that you get that as fast as you can. And then from there, you can really kind of choose how you want to go. Um, I personally think that Adornments is a good second, but I would go with uh, First Spawning just to get Frenzy for your Croxagores and Sacred Croxagore units, as well as Speed, then go Adornments, and that's just my personal opinion there. Um, after that, though, it's really, you can go Demon Crusher right there, right there but you want Sacred Wanderer so that you get Unbreakable as well. It's just, you want that. Why, why would you not? Um, but once you finish off the blue line, go back here to the yellow line and get your Miasma of Despair uh, upgraded down to Aura of Inertia. It depends. It really just depends on what you want to get get the bonuses for. Um, personally, I would probably do um, either melee attack or well, probably melee attack and weapon strength. You can get the the four requisites to jump over to Miasma. Um, then I would do. Uh, let's see. I I really like doing Woundmaker, and you already have a beefy amount of armor, but. Having more melee defense can't hurt, or, or hit points. I would go with one of those two, uh, with Woundmaker to get your Aura of Inertia. Uh, pretty cut and dry, pretty simple. So again, to recap, Spawn of Itza, of Itza, Draft Master, Lightning Strike, Geomantic Sustenance level 3, Renowned and Feared. Um, once you get level 10, 
Legendary Warrior, Cold-Blooded Reflexes, First Spawning, Adornments, uh, the Sacred Wanderer. You, you can do Demon Crusher if you want. It does give you a nice 10% weapon strength buff, so it's quite nice. So, that's how I would really approach a Nakai campaign. I think it's it's a little bit easier than Marcus Wolfheart, but it does have some tricky mechanics to it. You do have to really focus on keeping your vassal alive by sustaining them through your own armies and the proper usage of your rights. Also, what's really going to keep you alive in this campaign is knowing when to attack these four heroes. Don't do it until you're absolutely 100% ready that you, to deal with the level of aggression. Remember, you're not dealing with the standard Vortex campaign where you're going to have Norska and Chaos and Skaven hoarding over you like you did for 10 and 1. You're going to deal with a different instance here where you're just going to have the Hunts Marshals expedition coming at you from all sides on the north and east. Once you defeat all four of these, you can then defeat uh, the Hunts or uh, Marcus Wolfhard himself and get and trigger the Battle of Itza. So do that action if you have any questions about how to approach this campaign or places you're getting stuck please go ahead and let me know in the comments below um, again a huge shout out to lore master of sotek for helping me out here i will have a link to his channel in the description um, and again another shout out to uh kratos irving on the subreddit uh, that's a third shout out for him but i want to let him know that i i did see his awesome thread and that was such a really good uh, uh tip for nakai's campaign that i didn't even think of and i want to make sure he gets the the credit he is due so as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. My next tutorial video will be on the Golden Order. Um, I don't really want to do one on Gorok because personally, I think it's a very easy campaign. It's kind of like just hold out for as long as you can. If you really want to see a Gorok uh, guide video, let me know in the comments below. I will absolutely make one if the people want it. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching. Have a good one and take care.